Hello, welcome to KubeCon. Um, today I'm going to be talking about SetComp, what it can do for you. Um, I'm going to talk all about what we've been doing in SetComp in the container ecosystem and what is it and why does it matter and what is there, what work is there to do in future. Um, so um, I'm just in Cormac. I'm an engineer at Docker in Cambridge, and I've, I'm also on the CNCF TSC and a Nature maintainer. So I'm and I'm very much involved in the container security ecosystem. Um, so what what is SecComp anyway, and why does it matter? SecComp is a thing that stands for secure computing, which sounds like a, a really great thing. It's a bit of a ambitious name, perhaps. Um, back in 2005, when it was first created, it was basically an extreme sandboxing method um, when extreme sandboxing wasn't actually that common a thing. Um, it was really just for code that just does computer operations and could only read or write from existing files and basically exit. Uh, it wasn't used very much because there actually aren't very many programs that literally just read and write from files and can't, for example, make new network connections or anything like that at all. Um, so in 2013, uh, a more general version was introduced, which is called SecComp BPF, but is usually just called SecComp because it's the most commonly used version. Um, and this has small uh, BPF program. So BPF is a technique originally used for in the network stack. Um, you've probably heard about it recently about its grown up eBPF extended version, but BPF is the kind of original simple version. It lets you write very simple programs to decide if system calls should be allowed or not, or if they're not allowed, whether they should error or be logged or kill the process that's running them. So effectively, because system calls are the interface between applications and the kernel, this is basically as a method of controlling what programs can actually um, do outside just computing stuff. So what kind of interaction they have with the outside world, which sounds really useful. So in theory, you can take a look at what a program's doing. System calls are shown by S trace, so I've shown the S trace of um, just doing LS. Um, and for each of these system calls, you can basically say, yeah, that's fine. No, that's not fine. You haven't got permission to do that. You can pretend the system call doesn't exist at all, which is eno sys, um, or any other kind of operation. So that's the theory. In practice, it's not quite like that. For So for our examples there, when you open a file, um, with SecComp, you don't actually get, your program doesn't actually get to see what the file name was, unfortunately, because it just sees the direct arguments of the system call. And the argument for a open system call um, isn't directly a string. It's actually just a pointer to a string. And all you get to see is the pointer, and you can't follow the pointer to see what it pointed at, which is the name. So you have to make um, decisions actually based on quite limited information compared to what you might want. Um, and and. So, and you also, this is kind of limiting. You also can't know what kind of file descriptor has been used. If someone's doing a read, it could be read from a network or read from a local file, and you might want to allow one and not the other. You can't do that. There's also weird peculiarities. Um, and you also don't really get any context. You're just called every time the system call, and you can't actually keep state in between those. So you can't say, you can do this after you do that, but not before or anything like that very easily. So there's a bunch of real serious limitations. Um, the history of it applied to the container ecosystem. Um, back in early 2016, um, one of the first things I worked on when I started Docker with Jesse Frizzell was adding SecComp support for Docker. And it was enabled by default, which was a nice um, thing to have done. And most people don't disable it, so most people get it, got you know have had the benefit of using it since then. Kubernetes um, spent a long time uh, working out on its implementation, and really only in one nineteen, so not very long ago now, um, finalized the um, API, or, or um, and it does not enable it by default. Um, 
And it's still um, somewhat complicated to manage in Kubernetes because um, setcom f- profiles tend to be, at the moment, very long files. Like it, the Docker default one is 800 lines long, and apparently 800 more lines of YAML was seen as too much. So you have to work out how to distribute files with this configuration on if you want to customize the, this. Or you can just use the runtime default setting, which will give you something that's pretty much like the... Um, like the Docker setup, basically, as given you by the runtime. It'll be the Docker one. If you're using Docker, if you're using ContainerD, it'll be, or Cryo, it'll be similar, but um, due to kind of maintenance things, not exactly the same. Um, In the sort of OCI um, sort of structure of hierarchy we have in the container thing where we have Kubernetes and then CRI and then... um, we have um, runtimes. Um, it's kind of a complicated setup because, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but um, there's a bunch of abstraction layers this goes through. Um, effectively, everything's just passed down all the way to run C, which then um, it calls the go binding to libsetcomp, which is a simplified version of what um, the actual setcomp BPF looks like. Um, and this and these simplified calls are generated from a JSON config that um, is slightly, you know, is basically abstract again the kind of rules that you can use with um, with libsetcomp. So there's this weird, um, and then the runtime actually might have a different form of the JSON, which has if has different runtime customizations. So it's a kind of messy kind of process of converting JSON to JSON to go to C to BPF to run in the kernel um, to. So it's it's a bit kind of messy. What's the point of all this? What are we actually trying to achieve? I think it's very important to understand that. Um, there's some system calls in Linux which are not really considered safe for isolated programs to use. Um, some of these have a very, very large attack surface and there've been a lot of CVEs around them. Uh, Perf event open is one of those. Uh, user namespaces and BPF we'll talk about a bit later. These are just very large subsystems that in general, most containers uh, don't actually need to use. Um, often these are used by runtimes and, and other sort of software rather than actually end user applications. Um, and there've been a lot of CVEs that have basically meant that you can escape from a container if you can access these syscalls. So, Blocking them is actually proven to be useful. We'll talk about specific examples of where there's been a benefit later. Um, Some syscalls can disable security features, such as um, uh, the PR cuddle adder no randomize, which basically disables ASLR, um, address-based layout randomization, which is a security feature that's been added for good reasons. Um, So applications can simply turn it off, which is uh, really unhelpful. And some things are obsolete. Sys- there's a syscuttle as opposed to using sysfs, which in Linux has historically been generally, has been de- deprecated for uh, some decades now and has some attack surface and is not really maintained. It's some distros, I think, have removed this now, but not all of them. And then there's always been some things that have not been namespaced. Um, Time namespaces are very, very new, only came out a few months ago, and key ring namespaces don't exist yet. So there's a bunch of stuff that in a container system, it makes sense to just remove the ability of applications to use it. So what have we succeeded in doing with the setcom subsystem? Um, user namespaces, there's this quote from um, Andrew Lintmersky, one of the kernel maintainers, you know, basically um, saying that the huge attack surface from user namespaces is huge risk. Um, And if unprivileged users can program IP tables, they're bound to be some privilege escalations. He said this was before, um, this was, you know, this was actually quite a few years ago before when this functionality was kind of new. And shortly after that, I think the same year, we saw CV 2016, 33, 134, and a bunch of related CVs here where indeed the IP tables code uh, had some bounds checks missing and you could basically exploit this to get full root full, um, root and container escape. Um, normally this 
needs capnet admin which is not granted so normally it's safe but if you have user namespaces you get capnet admin in your user namespace you can call these commands in your user namespace you can't change root ip tables functions but you can um, compromise the kernel so it doesn't really matter whether it's actually which namespace it's in um, this was mitigated by docker's default um, policy and so users using that were not affected um, more recently, um, again, the BPF verifier, um, which again is, is, a, is a new feature for extended BPF, um, I had some uh, bounds checks on 32-bit operations that were uh, not enforced, and you could read and write kernel memory, which basically means you can control the entire host. Um, again, an unprivileged user with access to the BPF syscall could do this again. The Docker policy blocks use of BPF by default, um, unless you actually grant Capsys admin, which is basically a privileged access anyway. Um, so this sounds good. Uh, what went wrong? Um, actually, we caused a lot of problems for users during the last five years with SecComp. Um, I had a bit of a war on Emacs. <laughs> Uh, I stopped people running Emacs in containers with SecComp enabled for many years. Um, this was a really strange story. It really surprised me when this, the complaints came in about this quite early on. Um, Emacs had this very, very strange thing that um, a lot of people didn't like for other reasons. Um, the MuscleLibc maintainer was against it because it didn't work with MuscleLibc as well. But basically... It, in order to make startup of Emacs faster, it used to, um, during a build time, it would start running the binary, then dump the output, and then instead of um, rerunning the code that generated this, the initial setup, it would just load the, the memory snapshot, basically. But the way it required to do this was very nonpolar, but it required memory locations to be loaded exactly the same way as they were before. And if you had ASLR, this was not the case because memory locations would be randomized and so it wouldn't work. So it disabled it uh, by disabling randomization. But this was one of the things it explicitly blocked because this basically is allowing applications to bypass a security um, mitigation. Eventually, Emacs realized that, well, computers were fast enough. You could just run the startup code normally, like a normal application and not stop being so good, quite so weird um and so um this problem has gone away and now you can happily run emacs in containers um but really i i just felt it was not worth changing the default policy to basically um reduce security for everyone just so that emacs could be run more effectively with its weird things in a container worse than that though worse than breaking emacs i also broke steam this was not on purpose and not something i uh, wanted to do um linux has made a bunch of changes to 32-bit um so it's called abi uh, and steam happens to run 32-bit binaries and it's widely used in containers um, and this was something that happened really quite early on that um debian had i think has a habit of doing these things first they changed from um, the old socket call syscall that was some it was a weird multiplex syscall that does that could do socket or bind or connect or any of the other socket calls and switch to separate syscalls and we hadn't actually allowed for this change um and i think debian did it early um and they did the same thing with 64-bit time support on those two-bit systems they again they switched early before it was officially upstream and um these were all temporarily blocked by SecComp until we fixed this problem. So it, it is a problem and a fragility issue with SecComp that because it requires exact syscall lists, when some new set of syscalls that suddenly everyone starts using had to come along, you really have to update the code quickly, which is really problematic. And apologies to the Steam users. Um, there's also a performance issue. Um, there's actually a lot of rules because we list the syscalls you can use and not the ones you can't use. And the list is very long um, and it's not processed terribly efficiently for reasons that are mostly f somewhat fixable, but require a lot of work. Um, only really IO intensive applications will notice this. Um, 
And so actually very few people have complained, but a few people have, and they've generally disabled set comp rather than actually fixing it. And then there's some interesting areas, security issues, where set comp didn't actually help at all, and we didn't do anything to help users. Um, One of which is probably my favorite kernel CVE that Jan Horn found. Um, This is a really interesting security issue in Linux. It's a cache invalidation bug. Um, Basically, um, there was a a 32-bit counter, and if you did the right thing at at the point at which the counter wrapped around back to zero again, um, you could basically... um, uh, exploit the kernel and escape your container. Um, and all you had to do to do this was some memory mapping and some cloning of processes, which is all totally normal normal stuff that we couldn't possibly block with setcomp. Um, so there was just no way we could protect against this kind of thing. Um, it eventually was changed but fixed by changing a counter to be 64 bits. 32 bits is too small for any kind of security. Um, on anything, you can always overflow a 32-bit counter, but overflowing a 64-bit counter uh, is pretty impossible because it's so huge. Um, actually, it was actually interesting that there were... Uh, this was a re- this is still a really interesting CV and worth looking at, but it was hard to exploit without having some additional source of information to know when exactly um, you'd hit the uh, conditions for the exploit. Um and so actually we fixed an information leak um, that made it actually rel- made it actually relatively exploitable in containers uh, because of the information leak rather than actually because of the um, seccom but um, seccom could definitely not protect you against that um, the question I is like should we be using seccom in this way in the container ecosystem um, why is the container platform basically responsible for the, st- the poor kind of state of Linux kernel security and the fact that there are container escape vulnerabilities in Linux? And, um, you know, why, why isn't that the kernel's problem? Um, and generally, I think the answer is that we do want um, efficient isolation without going into using vir- virtual machines for everything. Um, it's actually relatively um the number of co- of container escapes has be exploits has been not too bad over the years um for most people this level of security is actually kind of fine um and also most of our applications don't use a whole you know the whole linux syscall space most applications use a kind of uh narrower subset that doesn't include um, you know the sort of specialized things you get in Linux doesn't most people's code doesn't run most application code doesn't run BPF it uh, doesn't um, run user namespaces those things are being used um, for security critical applications and often for control plane applications but end user applications basically just use networking and storage and I mean some people would say they should just use the POSIX subset and um, and Linux, the Linux syscall space is just way too expansive. I mean, I think there's arguments about what the the boundaries of um, what normal applications should care about are, but um, uh, and it, this does change over time with kind of performance reasons for using different system calls and so on. But um, you know, it's it, there is actually a kind of set of things that most applications don't use, and it's sensible for us to isolate them off for security um, because the common syscalls are basically mostly most of the time other than that cve i just pointed you at generally are actually safe um setcomp was designed that every application would write its own profile but this is really re- and r- really really difficult for users to do it was not designed for kind of platform administrators and like if you read the documentation we're kind of doing it wrong in the container space but it's actually too difficult for end user applications to use and you only find very very specialist applications things like you know firecracker use it and um a few other things but the the number of um 
general applications that actually have setcom profiles is really, really small, and it's incredibly difficult to use for that function. So I'm not really surprised. Um, I'm going to go through the things that we could do. Choose your adventure. What future paths could we take? What what should we do in this space? Um, I think it's definitely the case that things need doing. I'll talk about whether they will be done later. Um, one option is almost the status quo, really, is that almost no one will use SegComp, um, especially with Kubernetes. It's optional. Um, there's a few large companies I know who take it very seriously and think it's important. Um, Docker users got it by default, but gradually, um, as people shift over to using uh, you know, Kubernetes directly and things like that, where um, even if you're using Kubernetes with Docker, Kubernetes disables the Docker SegComp policy. Um, Docker is mostly now a development platform, so I'm not sure it makes sense for Docker to enforce it anymore. Um, if you're not going to use it, I recommend you update your kernel weekly. Um, that's a that's a burden. Uh, maybe using SegComp means you can do it less often than that. Um, maybe you get a higher rate of zero days, um, but the rate's relatively low. Maybe you can live with it. I I suspect that a lot of people are going to just continue to ignore it. Um, and just live with the vulnerabilities. Um, I don't think we could actually um, rationalize the policy. We we went for an allow list, not a block list at the beginning because of the whole issue. I mean, it's the recommended thing with SecComp. It's the recommended thing with most security things. Just, uh, you know, you know what you what's safe, you list what's safe, and then everything else is blocked. And so if there's a new dangerous syscall added, and many, arguably, the new syscalls often do have security issues more than the old ones, um, then you're safe. However, um, the list of things we block is now quite small, and writing the block policy is much easier and... Um, it's easier to understand. It's less likely to break something when um, new safe syscalls are added, like the the time sixty four ones for those two bit systems, which were, you know, these things. It turns out that there's new safe syscalls added a lot of the time because partly because of stupid things like there weren't enough flags allocated on syscalls, and there's now new syscalls with more flags being added for everything, things like that. Um, these block policies will be easier to understand because you can see what they do rather than try and re- work out the negative of what they do. Um, they wouldn't be 800 lines long. They would be maybe 10 lines long. So we could actually uh, inline them in the YAML. We'd have to obviously change the Kubernetes setcom format again to do this. Um, but, you know, I think this would be kind of nice if you could say allow BPF to remove the default block list approach to BPF. Um, and that would be the one line you need, allow BPF, allow open perf event, um, that kind of thing. So I think that would be easier to understand. There would be less maintenance work, wouldn't get people complaining things don't work and needing to suddenly fix them. Um, a lot of these problems have been like cross architecture problems with architectures have different syscalls and new changes and people running um, you know, a distro that expects one kernel on another and it behaves differently. Um, so those kind of issues could be improved. Um, the error the error support would probably be better with, with um, things like that. So um, the, the downside is there's potentially the block list, the default block list goes very small because everyone decides that these things are okay. Um, so, but I think this this is attractive, and um, I think it's definitely worth considering. Um, we have a huge problem in the Kubernetes ecosystem about whose problem is this? Should users really have to understand about SecComp? No. Um, should applications have to understand it? Too difficult. Is it? But should it be done at the Kubernetes level, where you have to configure it now? Or should it be the responsibility of the CRI? Or run or the sort of run C type layer of the actual container runtime. Currently, we're pushing responsibility up to the user, which is kind of terrible. Um, we why don't we have runtimes that provide actual security guarantees instead of just letting you configure it and making it your choice? 
we are starting to see some of these run terms. I mean, arguably GVisor, which I talked about in a second, um, and VM run terms are basically trying to make better security guarantees. Um, uh, you know, but why have we pushed down this whole idea that you list a bunch of syscalls in JSON, which is or syscall handling rules in JSON, which is what we're doing? It's a it's not a good design, uh, and there's a definitely a layering and responsibility issue that we need to solve. Gvisor, Gvisor is a really interesting response to this. It basically um, it basically re-implements large portions of Unix in Go. Um, basically, it kind of um, you know has a Go TCP stack and everything. And basically says, well, Linux wasn't very secure. We're going to re-implement it in Go in user space in a memory safe language and. Um, then we're going to write this up. We're going to use set comp internally in it just to make, because it doesn't actually use many syscalls. It has a performance hit and it potentially has compatibility hit, but it's a just like cut out all this security issues from Linux as, as a solution. It's a really interesting solution and definitely worth looking at. Um, something that I call the Lambda-like solution. Um, AWS Lambda kind of solved a lot of these problems by having a very restricted um, I say container runtime, it's strict. I mean, people don't think of it as a container, but it's a very similar problem space. Um, it uses set comp. Um, I haven't actually probed its policy to see what exactly what it does and doesn't allow. It has a custom Linux kernel with features removed, which is what um, a lot of people who run secure systems do is just disable a lot of parts of the Linux kernel. Linux has thousands and thousands of subsystems that are not generally very secure, and you can often access them by from user space by opening weird kinds of sockets that you don't really use in practice much and things like that. Um, but the Linux distros are very general purpose, and they tend to ship with a kernel that does everything, has everything as a module, loads anything, because, you know, they're general purpose. You might want to do anything. Um, not many people have locked down Linux kernel configs. Um, again, you probably should consider doing this, um, but everyone's kind of um, lives with their vendor configs for support reasons and stuff like that, and the vendors are not actually necessarily acting in your security interests all the time. Um, also in Lambda, no applications can run as root full stop. It just doesn't allow it. Um, again, in container space, we haven't forced that. Again, it's left to the user to enforce that. Um, you know, there's a restricted runtime API. Most of the file system is not writable and things like that in Lambda. We could do something very much like this. We could have a, you know, a container runtime that made these choices um, and had a clear delineation of what you can and can't do, and a security model and testing and things like that. In a way, the um, the sandboxed flag proposal for Kubernetes is kind of like this, but it doesn't define any kind of specification. It's a bit kind of some things can be sandboxed and some things might not be, but and they can decide what sandboxing is. But there's no kind of Linux um, runtime that makes these decisions. Um, in effect, the things like the Firecracker container do effectively kind of make those decisions for you um ish but um uh, but there isn't a kind of normal container runtime that does that um as of linux 5.7 there's something that we've been talking about for a really really long time that got merged is the EBF, ebpf lsm lsm is linux security module module these are things like se linux and app armor but se linux and app armor give you um a kind of general purpose way of configuring these LS, these security hooks in Linux for general purpose systems. The eBPF LSM basically says you can inject at each of the decision points in the kernel where it decides can a user do or not do something. Um, and there are a lot of these po points. They're much more than just at the syscall layer. There are all sorts of places like... Um, and there, and you get much more specific information about what's going on at these places as well than you do at this. This is called ABI. Um, you can basically run an eBPF program that can make real programmatic decisions about can this application do this at this point, and it can maintain more state and um, can make 
you know, basically have much more information um, to make these decisions. This is not simple. Um, I think, as I said, it's a startup size problem potentially, um, or perhaps an NSA size problem. I think the NSA uh, wrote SE Linux in the first place um, and basically defined the kind of shape of what it looks like. Um, and, you know, the NSA is a, an organization that's interested in this type of problem. Um, um, but yeah, it's the sort of thing that you could you could potentially do with a you know a, sm- a medium sized team and work on this problem for a few years. Um, this is very much looking at it as a technical solution. It doesn't solve the human problems of really what kind of um, what kind of policies do you need to enforce and what kind of model you've actually got here and how does the human communicate intent over this problem things like that. So there's still a lot of human problems that you have to solve there. So what is going to happen with SegComp? Um, my prediction is that the if you look at the state of the container ecosystem now, there's a continuing lack of investment in the low levels of the stack. Um, there's really not many people working on these problems. It's not clear who's, um, who's going to work on these problems. Um, most people seem to expect someone else to do it and not get involved themselves. Um, um, I think setting up an EBPF LSM container security startup is probably quite easy to get funded, but the other options might not even happen. Um, the serious service providers like the cloud providers are basically just using VMs. Um, and so that's why you're seeing quite mature things like um, Firecracker. The problem is that most no, most other users of containers are running their containers in VMs already. They're either running VMware on-prem or they're running in cloud provider VMs and not cloud provider bare metal or other bare metal. So most of them don't have the option of using VMs for containers at this point. Um, So even though their stack is becoming relatively mature, most people are simply not using it. Um, So... um, We'll probably see the split where more and more people are using, you know, provider services, like you know, cloud provider services, and they will just use um, VMs, VM-based containers um, via providers or or things like that, like you know, things like um, you know, the the Fargate containers of Kubernetes and AWS, things like that, which are all VM-based and um, just scale as as containers rather than as hosts. Um, We're not seeing security vendors solving this type of problem. Um, There's there's lots of reasons for this. Um, uh, Thomas Dullian's done a bunch of talks, which are interesting. Talk to me if you're interested in the question about why the security industry isn't interested in this kind of problem. And end user, as if Kubernetes find it difficult to contribute back to this sort of problem, because the, these problems are quite um, technically difficult. Um, there's um, n- not a lot of people who have the right kind of expertise around um, the Linux kernel and how things actually work in container runtimes and have time to work on these problems. They don't have other pressing problems to work on. It's kind of um, um, difficult. I mean, even very large end users have very, tend to have very little Linux kernel expertise. Um and um, they tend to work much mostly higher up in the stack, so uh, we're not really seeing much at the moment much end user contribution to solving these problems. So I'm actually not optimistic that a lot of this stuff will happen quickly. It's taken a long time, you know, to get where we are, and there's been little investment in it. Um, so um, thanks very much for that, um, and I'll be around to. Um, answer questions and um hope you enjoyed that talk and um it's been fun working on setcomp but i think you know there's a lot of interesting problems that uh, could be solved and actually aren't being so uh, if you're looking for a fun problem to work on it's uh, absolutely open for doing that <laughs>